My name is Simon Gobdell. I'm the director of Crash, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to an event co-sponsored by Crash and the Festival of Ideas. The Festival of Ideas runs uh, 170 talks in two weeks, which is a fairly extraordinary activity. And Crash runs about 350 events during a year. So you can also pick up the what's on the Crash as you go out, and you may find a lot of other things that you will be interested in. Uh, but tonight, it's an extraordinary pleasure for me to introduce Posey Simmons. Um, there's a famous story about uh, gangsters in New York who were uh, arrested, mafia people, and they were overheard on the phone saying, did you watch The Sopranos? It was like they, it was like they just got us perfectly. They must have been <laughs> listening. And I always think that there must be a lot of academics wandering around the world thinking, how did Posey get that just right? <laughs> there is that sort of extraordinary precision. Rarely cruel, I believe, but then again, I would as an academic, and uh, always brilliantly observed. And I think there are very few cartoonists today who manage to combine that absolute precision of vision with a real sense of what people are like. And so it's uh, an extraordinary pleasure to introduce Posey today, talking on making people. Making, yes, making. So, Posey, sir. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I'm going to say, can people at the back hear me? Yeah. No. Shout. Better? Yes. Um, I'm beginning with just a, a thought for the day. Um, it's the seven ages of women. It's the seven ages of women in, in cartoons. And it's just rather odd that um, the pedestal number two is very crowded and it all goes downhill after that. <laughs> um, the next few slides are really, it's a trip down memory lane. It's really, it's really to say, uh, I won't dwell on, on most of them at length, but, but to show um, what I've been doing since I was a, a nipper. Um, when I was, this is one I did when I was about nine. Um, a, a comic, um, Price Tuppence. Um, this is a spread from inside. For people at the back, uh, by the fifth frame, someone has murdered Peggy. And the, the police come terribly quickly. And five minutes later, the police are very extraordinarily polite. And they say, you may go now. Thanks awfully. And it's got rather bad language in it. Um, where's this damned crate taking me? <laughs> anyway, um, I did a lot of these comics really to amuse my older brothers. Uh, I went to art school where I, uh, I did a lot of life drawing and things like that, but I also did typography. I was very bad at ty typography. Uh, I'm very cack-handed at setting type, and so I taught myself uh, and was also taught how to hand letter, which later on stood me in very good stead. This is something I did as a student. It's disgusting typography. There's no indents uh, or anything. It's for a recipe for French partridges on a bed of watercress. <laughs> Um, after I left college, I worked freelance for anywhere, really, that would use an, illust an illustration. Um, in about 1971, I began uh, filling space as a kind of dog's body for the, for the Guardian. And it could have been anywhere. It could have been the letters page, the women's page. It was an act actually a wonderful way of starting. Being in The Guardian, you weren't paid very much, but um, you were always used. And they, um, and they would ring at about 11 in the morning. I lived near the paper. I would go in, uh, pick up coffee, the copy. Sometimes it was illustrious writers of the time, uh, like Neville Cardew, I don't know if that means anything, or James Cameron or Jill Tweedy. Um, and the drawing usually had to be done about three hours later. So it was very good training. So I, it could be anything. Um, there seems to be Beethoven. Um, 
in the about 1977, uh, Peter Preston, the g then editor of the Guardian, um, a man of few words, um, I met him in the lift, or rather, I was in the same lift. As, this sounds like a, an assignation. <laughs> I was, I got in at, and he got in, at, and there. Was, <laughs> and uh, after a bit, he said, Posey, have you ever thought of doing a strip? <laughs> and he then said, well, there's going to be a space on the page because there was a strip called Varumpshka. I don't know if any of you remember it. Um, and John Kent, who drew it, who drew, who'd drawn it for several years, he was leaving and uh, to go to America and there was going to be this big hole in in the page which is that space is that better ah it is isn't it I can I can even hear that those, those at the back um, and uh, and so this strip uh, which began in a rather strange uh, way it began very quickly uh, I thought I would have several months to work out who it was, who it was about. It actually, they rang up after about five weeks and said, oh, we're running it. And I help you can't. The first two months were very, very difficult. I didn't know who anybody was or who the characters were. And they only really settled down, I think, in a, by about three months later, by about August. Um, the strip, horizontal, it could be three frames, which it usually, usually was, but it could be, I could divide the, this area up into any way I liked. And the Guardian were, gave me a very, very free hand, in fact. They, they didn't really interfere editorially. To begin with, there was a, a thing about swearing. And actually, you got, in those days, you got, if you blasphemed, if you said, oh, wrote, oh, God, you, it, it was not, it was supposed not to be very good. Later on, you could, um, I used to write um, asterisks for, there was a pair of rather vulgar teenagers who just spoke in, in uh, four-letter words. And I used to just do the asterisks. And I got a, a two letters from headmasters who <laughs> said, would I please stop writing this filth? Because um, <laughs> it, it, it'd been copying the... the um, so there's another, uh, another example of another way that um, I chopped up uh, this, this space. And another way, uh, that shows Wendy Weber, who, along with her husband George, was really the main, they were the main characters of the, um, the, the strip. George was actually at a, uh, a poly, unnamed, uh, which later became a university, it became South Medial University, <laughs> uh, which he wasn't very pleased with. Um, but really, he would have liked to have been here at Cambridge, especially in those heady days of um, the 80s. He would have liked to have been in all the rows about structuralism, and, um, but alas, he wasn't. Um, sometimes I got uh, a whole page to do, which was uh, a lot of work. The, there I thank my training at the Central very much. Um, because of the hand lettering, which after a bit I could do very, very fast. The, the serif type I, I called anal retentive, because, <laughs> and then, which came in bold and italic. And, and then there, for the balloons, there was a, um, a, a sans serif um, version as well. Um, the other things I've done for The Guardian is, this is in the literary review, this is a literary doctor, Dr. Derek, who deals with, um, well, I th probably all of you know that writers have certain medical problems that other people don't suffer from. They, they're inclined to get blockages. <laughs> um, they can be very, very regular, about you know 5,000 words a day. And suddenly, you know, they sit in these little rooms. Oh, actually, I won't go on it. It's fine. 
<laughs> yeah. um, Dr. Derek, anyway, was um, rather low humour, but it was in the, um, the uh, review bit of the Guardian. As, as indeed this, this is, for those at the back, this is, this is from a reading uh, group from um, school, and I think it's, you know, it, it, I think it's Meryl who sang to Peggy, no Peggy, you're wrong, I think the white knight was Lewis Carroll's penis. <laughs> Sometimes I had a very nice job of illustrating other people's uh, writing. In this case, um, it was Caroline Duffy. Uh, it's, and in the paper, it's always nice to have colour. And I've also done uh, children's books, and I'll sort of whip through these. Um, after I did these having done years and years of black and white in The Guardian. And when my editor at Jonathan Cape said, oh, why don't you try a children's book? I mean, I jumped at it because it was a, an opportunity to, um, you know, to use colour, which is much more difficult. Black and white is like black and white or grey, but colour is impossible. Um, this is about a dead cat. It's about his life. Um, he, he actually was the Elvis Presley of the, the cat world. Um, and I seem to have a thing about cats, because here's another one, who's um, a, a downtrodden cat who um, works for a, a revolting baker who makes him do all the work, um, but, but he triumphs in the end. Um, this is Matilda, who told such dreadful lies and was burnt to death. Um, when, when this edition of Hilaire Bullock's poem came out in America, there was a, a letter sent to the, uh, the London office saying, does she really have to be burnt to death at the end? Can we not? And, um, <laughs> um, and I'm afraid, afraid she did. Um, in about 1981, I wrote, this is, this is true love. It, it, I suppose now it would be called a graphic novel, but then it was just called a kind of comic story. Uh, it's the story of a, a secretary who falls in love with her boss, who's called Stan Upright. Um, but her, one of her fantasies is of going to a party on the arm of Cliff Duff, who is the most handsome man in the world. Um, and this shows her doing just that. Um, then I drew, some, pe some people I just draw, uh, and I don't know who they are, and they're waiting in a way for a role. This, I think, is probably a Guardian reader. <laughs> um, um, here is a mother. Um, here is a house husband. And the next thing I'm going to run through is, up until I did the episodes which became the books, uh, Gemma Bovary and Tamara Drew, um, I would invent characters uh, very, very quickly, depending on whatever deadline it was in the paper. So this is the first process of a strip which was, would be for Guardian Review. and. I can't remember when the deadline was for it now. I think it was something like Tuesday. So by the Thursday b before, I would be getting very sort of itchy. Um, I would, this, I, my idea then was to, I think, draw, I think some authors have, are on a stage at a literary festival. That's the idea. So I have a good scribble first and I write down things. Um, <coughs> I don't know what I've written here. Sadism, violence, what? Anyway. <laughs> um, and I then want to draw a character. Um, one, of the, one of these, or several of these authors that are sitting on the stage. So I started this page on the, on the far left, and I drew the man with stubble, with his downturned mouth, 
And I thought, actually, I don't think he looks like a writer. He looks as though he works for the BBC or... <laughs> um, so then I had another go. I, I quite like the downturn mouth. I, it's a kind of, you know, you, you keep a bit, remove another bit. I gave, made him, gave him a different nose and so on. And I, and by the time I got to far, uh, is that the right? I'm ambidextrous, isn't it? That side, anyway. Um, he turned into a Welsh poet um, <laughs> called, um, I think I called him Evan Lloyd. And, um, and so he, the next stage of doing this is to rough out what's happening in the, and, and the, the dialogue. Um, I thought another uh, person on this, on this dais would be somebody like Will Self. There would be a lady author and a, and a nice gentleman, a cardi. <laughs> um, and that would be the very next, the, you know, I would do this quite quickly. I always like to get the writing in so I know how big I've got, how much space I've got for the, for the drawing. And really then the next thing is to do the artwork. Um, Evan Lloyd has no speaking role whatsoever. He just sits, <laughs> he just sits at the, the, end, the end of the row, but looking kind of um, Celtic and... Uh, um, yes, Gemma Bovary. This began again with, with my editor, not Peter Preston this time, but uh, another editor saying, what would I like to do? Um, did I want to carry on, you know, doing strip uh, in uh, the, the, the review or what? And I said, well, I'd like to do a story with a beginning and an end. And this particular editor said, ooh, like, like, a, like a serial. And I said, yes. And he said, ooh, 100 episodes? So I said, yeah. Um, and then he said, um, mm, space, ooh, ring you back. And then he rang back and said, ooh, I've got you three columns wide by the depth of G2 in The Guardian. And so I said, help, it's, it's sort of long and thin, it's like a giraffe. But, and and I, it's not the usual sort of space for a, a strip which is linear. And he said, well, tough. Um, <laughs> but actually, in the end, it's a space I, I began to like very, very much because it allowed for more layers. You could zigzag down it. You could split it in all kinds of ways. Because there were many layers, you could... Um, it allowed for different voices to come in, different bits of narrative. Um, I found it incredibly f flexible. Um, in a way, I didn't know what I'd let myself in for. It was to be daily, uh, in black and white. And I thought, I'll, I'll have about perhaps 30 episodes ready before it, ru before it runs. Before I'd... Uh, when I got the idea of doing, basing something on Flaubert's great novel, Madame Bovary, uh, which I'd got not because I wanted to use a 19th century novel, but because in Italy I thought I saw Madame Bovary, a modern one. I saw this very, very beautiful woman in a cafe, um, surrounded by shoot her, you know, Prada bags and God knows what, she's been shopping and burning her plastic like mad, treating, and I think he must have been a lover, um, like, a, like a dog. Um, she was sort of beckoning him all the time, Ricardo, veni qua, and sort of he had to light her, light her fag and uh, move the umbrella and do things. And she, while she was smoking, she kind of exhibited such ennui and, and despair and kind of, oh, I mean, life was <laughs> so awful. And three of us were sitting, Look, I'm afraid, gazing 
and um, and we said it's Madame Bovary. <laughs> so that gave me the the idea of having an English Madame Bovary who would um, buy a house in Normandy, like many people were doing at the time, and who would um, not take rat poison, perhaps, but um, it would end tragically. Mm. I worked, first of all, in an, just in a notebook. I didn't write a word, having got the, the, um, the idea. And because it was a 19th century uh, story, my first efforts were really to uh, have a kind of 19th century kind of um, flavour to them. But I... That's what, that's what I was faced with. That's the, the, that's the, the layout. And that, that's me trying to cram everything in. And that's the finished thing in the paper, which could be or chopped up in all kinds of different ways. Um, Princess Diana was alive at the time. And when I was thinking about what Gemma Bovary would look like. Uh, it was to do with the eyes. Often I do dots for eyes, but I thought that Gemma should have pupils. And I liked the way that Princess Diana was always sort of looking under her fringe, or looking under her fringe, sorry, I'm screwing in the... <laughs> and, uh, and looking out of the corner of her eye. So I borrowed, I borrowed her eyes. She was alive at the time. Um, sadly, she died, um, I think, the next year where I was doing it. But I did borrow some of her, her, her suits and things, too. Gemma begins as a rather scruffy um, English woman. You know, she, she probably doesn't have her legs waxed, and <laughs> she's got mosquito bites and things. And, and a a bit after that she's Gone, uh, she's gone to live in France. She acquires a lover and some French polish. <laughs> and she, she's only got one foot. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but she did have two feet in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew she was going to go shopping and um, get into debt like uh, Madame Bovary, um, and that underwear and all kinds of things like that would, would feature. Um, and here, here she is, as I then drew her in the notebook. Um, she's before she's gone to uh, <coughs> to, f to France here, but I wanted her to look both sort of plump, but quite, but quite appealing. This is the narrator, uh, who's a who's a baker. He's called uh, Raymond Joubert. And I saw this man in a, in a bar in Brittany and um, uh, did not draw him there, but drew him late, later. Um, he's, he's probably, I imagined he was uh, somebody in 1968 would have perhaps thought of throwing a pavé, but um, probably didn't. And, and I imagine him having a, a, a literary literary side that he he would say he'd been in publishing once in Paris but in fact it was um, school books for Africa but common um, it was it was publishing and then he's taken over the the bakery of his father in um, in Normandy and this is how he looks in the <laughs> in the in the first episode uh, I only found his voice after drawing about six episodes. It was before it was published. I began by writing the, the narrative in the third person. And the example of Flaubert was Flaubert's matchless prose was always before me. And it, and it, was, it was awful what I'd written. And it was only when I was drawing uh, this baker that I began because I I talk to myself a lot when I'm writing so I was sort of going en mm, français un peu and I thought actually he can he can narrate it and as soon as I I um, discovered that 
it, it became much, much easier. I was going to set it in, I had an idea of setting it in maybe Provence or the Dordogne because that's a place where lots of English people go. Um, but after reflection, I decided this rather, rather grim story um, had to be in Normandy, had to be in a sort of rainy climate. And, and apparently Rouen is known as the piss pot of France. <laughs> and, and so Rouen it became. Uh, at, up to this point I'd done very little writing and as I later discovered uh, from in being involved in an actual film um, that writing a serial, I mean it is like drawing a film that you you, you are responsible for the casting, this is location here, but there are some props at the bottom of the, the, um, you know, the, uh, the crocs, the costume, the lighting, the, um, uh, al almost everything. Um, it, you do almost everything that a, a director does, um, except I don't sleep with the characters. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, not saying that, uh, I'm not saying that directors do sleep with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is how I would then start writing um, with the three columns and cramming it in. Um, it was before computers were used, at least before I used a com computer, and I actually found, because I was taught typography in the old-fashioned way, that it was much quicker to write in 14-point um, uh, with three-point leading than, than actually do it on a, you know, to set it on a computer. Um, it wasn't, it's not particularly clever, it's how we were taught in, in the 60s. But, but it made my job here very, very quick, because I would then, my husband's in fact a typographer, I would then give him this piece of paper and he would then set it for me. Uh, Tamara Drew came about um, by being asked, this time by the literary review that I'd been working for, uh, to do another, to do another thing and they, they said do you think, you, as it's in the literary review, do you think you can hide another novel in it? And I said, oh, well, I'll think about it. And, but my first idea wasn't, in fact, to put Thomas Hardy in it. I thought of a, an art, a writer's retreat, kind of uh, buried in the countryside. And I was busy thinking of, oh, this peaceful, what goes on, nothing, oh, writing, writing, um, far from the madding crowd, far, far from the madding crowd. <laughs> um, and then I thought, well, why not Hardy? Because the bones of the story are, um, are very good. It's uh, a young woman with three suitors. Um, and so that, that was almost, um, almost immediately uh, I didn't have much trouble in, in thinking of that, that idea. And this is how she, this is the sort of scribbles again in the, the notebook that I began with. Um, it, this one shows uh, Tamara. Um, it shows Ben, who's, who's the, the equivalent of Sergeant Troy, who I knew would be unshaven. I didn't know quite what he did at that time, but I knew he'd be in a fight. And the equivalent of Gabriel Oak, who I knew, who's the one um, at the bottom right, I, I knew he'd be sort of hunky, uh, and I called him Andy Cobb. <coughs> this, this is the space that The Guardian gave me. It's, um, so the format was much squarer. These are two episodes, one on top of the other. So it was two episodes a week, a um, hundred episodes again, in colour, <coughs> and the delivery date was, ooh, I know it was Tuesday, yes, I know, because I still have a residual kind of bump in my week where I go, because uh, by, by Monday I would be feeling extremely stressed. 
This is the first drawings of uh, Beth, who runs this writer's retreat. She's married to a very uh, successful writer called Nicholas Hardiman, who writes intelligent, um, I think that's what his reviewers always say, in intelligent um, thrillers and make shed loads of money mm -hmm. and I wanted to compare him with uh, an author or a not even published author with an academic in fact who who was at a university not at all like Cambridge mm -hmm. perhaps it might have even been South Medial University mm -hmm. where he was very worried about his course not attracting too many uh, enough students and um, anyway he's wangled a sabbatical and he's at the retreat to to write the fifth draft of his novel um, so this is Beth this is the first these are the first drawings for the academic Glenn who in fact is based on a real academic um, who I heard lecturing on biology uh, hang on. he said he was American I study the ecology of intertidal life, tide pooling environments, uh, usually in a demarcated wilderness environment. Um, and I, he was wearing such good things. He had this wonderful American red hair, and he had good Timberland shoes, he had elephant cord trousers, a magnificent Harris Tweed jacket, a Brooks Brothers shirt, a very nice Shetland sweater, and he looked very wholesome. Um, Glenn, in fact, is genial, but slightly opportunist. And, that, <laughs> and, that's, and that's how he, he turned out. I, I wanted to give him slightly Bugs Bunny teeth. Um, and here he is. He does spend a lot of time in the, in the lavatory. At <laughs> uh, the same time, I had to uh, do research in Dorset, and actually I did some in Somerset too, um, to find the sort of farmhouse where this retreat was going to be. I wanted there to be a very nasty barn conversion, and I, I found one. Um, but I also wanted this retreat to be immensely, um, immensely comfortable and very, very good food. And um, so all these notes went into, a, in, went, went into this vast notebook I kept. These are the first drawings I did for two teenagers called Jody and Casey. And I wanted to contrast uh, life for them in this idyllic bit of Dorset um, with life that the, uh, the writers found far from the madding crowd. Uh, to the writers, it's a wonderful, peaceful place full of um, ancient oaks and and swords and green loins of hills, etc. And for Jodie and Casey, it's just dead boring because the the local bus service was cut off, uh, you know, two years ago. And there, and you, you know, to get in, you've got to get left into Oakhampton. And if you can't get back, you've got to spend five hours there, and you got three pounds in your pocket, and it, and it's just terribly boring. And I did go on buses or drove around that kind of area and it was extraordinary seeing that most, mostly near bus shelters there would be al always two teenagers sitting there kind of looking just bored or not bored but kind of uh, what to do. If there was a, uh, a waste paper basket in the uh, bus shelter it would be billowing with smoke, so that would be <laughs> that would be some good fun. Um, here, so here they are in their bus shelter, reading um, reading Goss and Chick, um, which is the equivalent of heat. I don't know if we have we got any heat readers in uh, yeah, good, oh good. Um, heat or close closer or um, it. 
I was amazed from um, really just listening to teenagers how much they knew about celebrities. They probably knew more about them than they did, say, their granny's life. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and you would hear them discussing in minute detail about whether so-and-so got extensions or, uh, you know, what their nails were like. Um, I, I didn't want, I wanted to have their speech patterns exact. Um, I didn't, it's very, it's a sort of difficult line not to be as an adult sort of down amongst the kids and being, um, I would have hated that. Uh, I wanted to reflect what their life was like uh, in, the, in the countryside. And so I, I mean, I talked to teen teenagers. I, I'm afraid on the bus because they were yelling into their phones. I did also listen a lot to, to uh, 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 what they were saying. And I got the line here from the bus where uh, Jody says, this is about you don't know what you'd be letting yourself in for, Casey. They can't kiss. Snog Ryan, bet you would be like a donkey eating an apple. <laughs> um, which is very nice of them. Um, and so this is Jodie and Casey in, in their <laughs> idyllic um, surrounding, but, but with, their, with their, trust, their trusty phones. Um, this is the bus shelter, which is based on a real bus shelter, um, which for The Guardian I had to clean up because the yeah. graffiti on it was so disgusting. Um, this, this was in Somerset, if you're ever passing <laughs> near Castle Carey, there's this very disgusting bus shelter. Um, I wanted the countryside also to be, in a way, a kind of character. I mean, rather in a kind of homage to Hardy, in a way, because in his, in Far From the Madding Crowd, there's such a sense of the countryside, of farm life, of barns and, and seasons and uh, creatures and sheep and things. So I wanted, as, as far as I could, but I was strapped for space, uh, so I couldn't have that many, um, you know, huge illustrations. So this is a, an example of a kind of combination um, episode. At the top, there's uh, the writer, Nicholas Hardiman, just writing away all day, and I wanted the change of uh, the panes of his window gradually go blue and then go dark, so he's at it the whole day. Outside, the cows are munching. The third row, and this is an image I'd always had, was of his wife Beth um, in the evening going to one shed and collecting the eggs that the hens had laid and going to another shed where her husband was working to collect what he'd produced in the day. Um, so that in a way, although she was a wronged wife, she also uh, controlled him. I mean, she, she, she ran his life. So I wanted, I wanted there to be, um, although he is a, a rat bag, I also wanted him to, you know, have something uh, to get fed up with, of being kind of this kind of goose that laid the, the golden egg. <laughs> Um, in the, in the, uh, with so few <coughs> episodes, there were very, there was very little opportunity to do what I like most in comics, which is actually to have a kind of silence, so that you just move from image to image, um, and there are no balloons or there's no narrative to, to kind of distract, so it becomes a kind of totally visual experience. I, I didn't have enough, often enough opportunity to do this, but this was one. I wanted a rainy night with um, Beth wondering what has happened to her husband and um, Glenn, the academic, in his horrid 
barn conversion, looking out at the rain too. When I began, this is the nuts and bolts of the writing. Um, I was still not computer literate, so this was done on an A2 pad. Um, and I would, it, it allowed you to make little diagrams and to, to, to work out if, if down at bottom right, it was, I was sort of working out if, if X loves mm, what happens and who is jealous and it, it, I found it easier to work out visually. The mess in the middle, that sort of lots of black hatching, is where somebody rang me up. <laughs> and I and I had a had a bit of a, a scribble. Uh, that's the next stage, which was to paginate it so that um, there are, I, at the back it may be difficult to see, but there are little coloured bobbles in each of the squares, and they represent who is in the who is in the episode and and vaguely what is happening in it. And it helped me see if, if, if a character kind of um, was missing for a long while. Um, with a, with a, the difference, obviously, between a, a, a serial and a, and a novel is the amount of time that elapses between reading pages or, or episodes. This has got a whole week. And so I couldn't deviate much from the plot. I couldn't, I, I mean, I had ideas for lots of ideas and, and trails that I would have uh, liked to have gone off on. But in a way, you had to keep the engine of the plot absolutely on the rails, or otherwise readers would have got lost. Uh, this is the way I wrote. Uh, I began on the right hand side. Uh, writing every th single thing I wanted to put in the episode. And there's a sort of thin column next to it where I wrote things that I'd forgotten. And on the left, I then transformed the writing on the right. Um, I cut it and made it as, as short and as concise as I could and worked out the, the dialogue. And I might do this thing maybe three or four times so that the, the narrative boiled down to, uh, was as clear as possible and took up as least room uh, as, as possible. Um, and I would do then this bit first before planning any of these spreads, simply because if I knew, once I knew where the, the writing was going, um, uh, then I knew how big, how much room I'd got for the, the, uh, the drawing. So here, here's a stage in a, in a spread. This is, this is Nicholas and Beth. Um, and they're, they're about to have a huge row. Uh, so I would write it and, and draw it in quite a, a scribbly way. And the artwork which would probably take about an afternoon, um, is, is that I would go, having, having written my, st my narrative out in pencil, I would go to my husband and say, can you knock this up in whatever it was? And he would, he would do so. And, and then I would combine it um, with, the, with, the, with the drawing. So it was a kind of cottage industry. Here we have the row uh, at the bottom. Uh, it, uh, the the woman as as tells her husband to to um, uh, take a running jump, and um, it's got to be overheard by three people. So it's quite a it's quite a there's writing at the top. There's quite a uh, a condensed um, row in the middle, and then. So there's quite a lot going on, and that's, and that's what it looked like when it was done. This, this is an episode, ooh, it seems to be in French. Um, I don't know how that's happened. Um, this is an episode where I managed to have uh, 
a bit of silence and I needed it because this is a stealthy episode. This is where uh, Nicholas Hardiman is about to seduce the heroine Tamara Drew and he's parked his Range Rover and he's rung his wife to say, oh it's me, um, I've just left the London Library um, and uh, the traffic is absolutely terrible so you start supper, I'll, I'll have it, put mine in the oven, I'll have it when I get in. And then I wanted to have, in the, just in this episode, him, him making his way to the farmhouse where uh, tomorrow, tomorrow lives. And that's what happens. Um, but at the top, there's another voice, which is Tamara, who's a journalist. And she's not a very sort of elevated journalist. She writes about uh, her, you know, she can write about handbags. She, she, she writes about things that have happened to her. And, um, uh, and I hoped that by the end of the, uh, the strip, I'd made her writing uh, get, get a bit better. And this is the first appearance of uh, Tamara. Um, this was a very, very difficult uh, spread to do. So many things had to happen. She had to appear wearing her, her minuscule shorts. Uh, there had to be four reactions from four different people. And, uh, and, and a bit of narrative. The narrator here is Glenn. The 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 uh, uh, the American um, and the blue squares are I, I used blue a lot when I wanted to sh to have people's kind of private reactions so that when they were slightly back from the 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 pre the present of the um, uh, the ep the episode and. I'm nearly uh, at the end of my slides. I think there's, is there one? Oh, the, oh I didn't know really. Oh, this, this seems to be a wedding. <laughs> um, yes, oh, so we, we're ending on a, on a, we're ending on a wedding. Um, yeah. Um, now, I, do, I don't know whether the, uh, there's, there's time for any um, quest questions? The, um, should we take some questions? Yeah. We could do. Perhaps we should thank the president. Should we? Oh, <laughs>